Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? So, we are gathered for a momentous occasion, something that has been 20 years in conception and 15 years in construction, the Spinnaker machine. This has been uh, a staple part of the school for as long as I've been here. So this really is a milestone in the history of the school. And for many of us, uh, this really seemed like science fiction when Steve first proposed it all those years ago. So today, we have uh, three distinguished speakers for you. The first of which will be Steve, who will describe to you what this thing is. The second of which will be uh, Sasha Albada over here, who will be describing the uh, neuroscience applications of Spinnaker. And finally, we have Mike Denham on the front row here, Professor Mike Denham, who will be discussing uh, a spin-out company called MindTrace.ai that is exploiting the inte intellectual technology in Spinnaker. So without further ado, I will be handing over to Professor Colette Fagan, who is Vice President for Research at the University of Manchester, who will say a few words and introduce our speakers further. Colette. Thanks very much, Gavin. Uh, welcome, everyone. Gavin's just introduced me, so I won't repeat that. But I'm really delighted to be part of this event to celebrate Spinnaker's switch on and to share this historical moment. The Spinnaker machine, I'm told, is revolutionary and novel computer architecture. It's designed for large-scale neuromorphic simulation and it's capable of simulating 1% of the human brain in real time. I mentioned that to my son this morning and he just went, wow. He's uh, a 16-year-old just starting A-levels in physics and maths. It's also an exemplary of low-energy computing. Now, this pioneering brain-inspired computer platform has been 20 years in conception, 10 years in construction. The ambition of this project was so visionary and far-reaching that many thought it to be akin, as Gavin said, to science fiction at the inception. But it's delivered, and it's delivered successfully on its vision ambitions, and today reaches its ultimate goal. One million microprocessors will be activated at once and working in concert. That is fantastic. Such major scientific discoveries are not possible without creativity, a long-term horizon, determination, hard work, and perseverance by a team who've been assembled to bring together the very best and to mobilize their skills and knowledge. And Professor Steve Ferber in our School of Computer Science had led this fantastic and large international project over the past 15 or so years. Now, of course, many others have been part of the team. Around 50 PhD and students and postdoc research assistants. And together, the team has produced over 50 articles, including three which count among the very best world-leading papers and are highlighted in the faculty's in abstract spotlight on world-leading papers on its webpage. Of course, the team needs funding to bring such magnificent ideas to fruition, and this has been possible here with long-term and large-scale funding from both EPSERC and the European Union to the tune of about 15 million. And we're delighted that we're joined today in our celebrations with a representative from EPSERC, Dr. Anna Angus-Smith. Now this project, Biologically Inspired Computing, epitomises the best of what we continually strive for at the University of Manchester. It's ambitious, it transcends disciplinary boundaries, it produces excellent science and creates research training and early career opportunities to build our next generation of scientific leaders. And it makes a positive impact and contribution to society, including through industrial collaborations. And we're going to hear some of that. Artificial intelligence, machine learning and robotics are fast-moving fields, no longer the space of science fiction. These technologies have enormous potential to make positive contributions to so many aspects of our lives as well as creating new risks and new ethical questions about the relationship between the human and non-human. 
but this whole body of activity and imagination and realising that imagination are at the heart of the strategic priorities for research and teaching at Manchester for the foreseeable future. They're central to our focus on Industry 4 and Data Sciences, which priorities in our current recruitment of 100 Presidential Early Career Fellows. And it's a fundamental part of our recently launched Digital Futures interdisciplinary and university-wide network of 800 plus and growing academics. I am confident that Steve and the rest of the School of Computer Science will continue to make a significant contribution to our research and teaching in this arena. So I'm now going to hand over to Anna to say a few words and I shall see you all later at the parties and celebrations. So thank you very much for inviting me today. I, I'm really excited to be here, and I know people always say that in a really platitudinous way, but I mean it because I actually think it's really unusual that we get together to celebrate science, science that's been transformative over a long period of time. And I'm not just saying this because I've seen the plans for the cupcakes with the champagne and the balloons, but actually because it, it is really important that we do that. We usually do these events when we're trying to launch something, but actually getting together and saying it's really wonderful that we've, we've done this research over a long period of time, I find genuinely really exciting. So Gavin sent me a couple of exam questions when he asked me to stand up and talk, probably because he knows that I ramble otherwise. And the first one was, how in the future will UKRI fund this kind of transformative, risky uh, research over the long term? And the first thing I thought about when I looked into how we've supported Spinnaker over, to be honest, longer than I've worked at EPSRC, is that actually we've done so through a number of different kinds of mechanisms, both through our own funding and through EU funding and other funders. And that the important thing about UKRI is that we will not lose those mechanisms to fund transformative, risky research with long-term potential. We won't, because people like me think that they're important, and we think that our job is to make the case to colleagues in the government about why it's really important that we do this long-term research. However, UKRI also has a mission to, tr to deliver the government's aspiration of investing up to 2.4% of GDP in research innovation, and it's doing that through additional opportunities. And I started talking to, to Gavin about those earlier, and I think I blew his mind slightly. But actually, I really would encourage you to look at some of those additional opportunities because they sit alongside this core funding that we've always had and we will continue to have for transformative risky research, and they give really great opportunities to all of you in the room. And that links me straight into the second exam question, which was talk about AI strategy, Anna. <laughs> Roughly, wasn't it? I think my response to that is it's a really exciting time for all of you who are involved in, in AI, whether it's fundamental research or more applied research that aligns with the broad AI agenda, as lots of people who know less about AI see it, frankly. Why is that? Because if you look at the, the government's industrial strategy white paper, uh, AI and the data economy is one of their four grand challenges. And what we do when, we, when we're trying to bid into the government and when we're thinking about what they might invest in is they look at their own industrial strategy and they, they try to make a line investment. So we've already seen investment in, in up to 20 CDTs training students to, in AI. We'll do interviews on those next week. And I, I truly believe we will continue to see additional investments in AI. I'm not keeping them from you, what those opportunities are, but you, you need to be aware that they, they will arise possibly on short timescales, but they will happen and you need to be ready to respond to them. So it is an exciting time, but I think you, need, you just need to, to keep an eye on the horizons for new opportunities to do things like this. Now I'm quite aware that I'm standing between you and the actual exciting stuff. So I think I should stop rambling, hence the two exam questions. Thank you very much, and I'll pass back to Colette. Thank you. So give your hands up and the floor to Professor Steve Ferber, who's going to tell us all about it. So, uh, thank you very much for those generous introductions. Um, today is mainly a party. We're celebrating achieving this milestone which we set longer ago than most of us can remember. Um, and, and, you know, I see people in the audience who are on the steering committee who have completely forgotten we were trying to do this donkeys years ago. Um, uh, so, it's mainly a celebration which will be happening upstairs in the common room and in the Atlas rooms where there will be suitable refreshments. 
but you have to, of course, suffer before you can have fun. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the history of the project, um, where we've got to, uh, and then I'm going to uh, call on uh, friends and collaborators to tell you a little bit about how Spinnaker has been used outside Manchester, uh, or at least outside the university. The goal we set ourselves a very long time ago was to see what we could do if we put a million mobile phone processors, and they're made by or designed by ARM in Cambridge, if we put those into a single computer able to support real-time models of the brain. And back at the beginning, we realized that even with a million processors, you only get to 1% of the scale of the human brain, and that's with lots of simplifying assumptions. And in practice, um, uh, we're probably a little bit less than that. Um, the same 1% uh, of the brain is about equivalent to 10 whole mice. And now, with the sort of richer knowledge we're getting of, of, of mouse brains, realistically, we can probably still run a, a, a single mouse brain network on Spinnaker um, if we do the work to get ourselves there. Now, how did all this come about? Well, um, you've already heard the 20 years in conception story, and the origins of the project do go back to 1998, which, if my arithmetic is right, is exactly 20 years ago. Um, when, by virtue of, of, of getting some funding from ARM in Cambridge, uh, we were eligible to apply for a small EPSRC grant under the heading of ROPA, or Realising Our Potential Award. Now, uh, these grants are so far in the distant past that, uh, that Anna is not sure uh, what they are. Um, but I can tell you, uh, the requirement here was that you had to have qualifying industrial funding and you had to propose a new direction of research. So in the 90s, uh, my group was designing a, a wide range of asynchronous processor technology, and we had to take this off in a different direction. And I'd become frustrated at that point by the fact that although processors were very much faster than when I started playing with them in the late 70s, they still couldn't do things that brains found easy. Um, but I was also interested in associative memories and how you build those on chips. And so we produced this proposal to design efficient VLSI architectures for inexact associative memories. Standard associative memories, which kind of do reverse lookup compared with conventional memories, are very brittle. You give them the right input, they give you the right output. But if you give them an input with very small errors, they give you completely meaningless output. <coughs> So the question is, could we make that softer? Could we make memories that gave you approximately the right output if you gave them approximately the right input? And the answer to that question, as we pursued it, um, basically amounted to, however I looked at it, we appeared to be reinventing neural networks. Okay? So in, in this work, all paths seem to lead back to neural networks. So at the end of that, I thought, well, OK, if, if, if that's the case, um, maybe I should pay some more attention uh, to neural networks and, and see where that leads. And I started looking at uh, what was being done around the world in building systems, because basically my group of computer engineers, we build stuff, uh, building systems to support uh, neural network modeling. This, there was then quite a gap um, while we thought about this and uh, discussed plans and things bounced backwards and forwards until eventually um, we came up with a sufficiently coherent set of ideas uh, to bid for a grant. And again, you see this is EPSRC responsive mode. And the title here is a scalable chip multiprocessor for large-scale neural simulations. And that, if you like, is the Spinnaker concept. And uh, we, we attracted this funding and started designing the silicon itself. The issue of scale really came in with the next grant, um, and this was the last ever ICT large grant, because this was a scheme that EPSRC ran up to a point, and uh, we were fortunate to get the last one, which was particularly well adapted to what we wanted to do. And here we have the title, Biologically Inspired Massively Parallel Architectures, Computing Beyond a Million Processors. So you see the million processor target um, had certainly appeared by the time this proposal went in, which was presumably sometime in 2008. And uh, that pointed us in the direction of the trajectory which we've, if you like, come to this major milestone on today. And 
the thing I want to note here is although um, we now receive quite a lot of funding from EU sources, we would not have been in a position to even bid to engage in projects such as the Human Brain Project had we not built these foundations uh, using UK funding from EPSRC. Now, I don't want to take you through every possible grant uh, because there are quite a lot of them. Um, and and there are some of these are specifically Spinnaker related and some are broader with components of support for Spinnaker. There are some grants here where Spinnaker was used as a tool to support other work. Uh, you'll see there's quite a lot more EPSRC support on there, uh, but also it got us in a position to bid to join the Human Brain Project, and um, that's now our major source of funding going forward to develop a second generation machine, which I'll say a bit about later, and to continue improving the software support um, for this machine to extend it to a, a large sort of global user base. And en route, we've had some other European funding through the European Research Council, and the little bit at the bottom, which is small because it had to fit on the slide, but not insignificant, is the university actually uh, provided an injection of a of quarter of a million of capital because we set off building the million core machine with the target of delivering it on a build cost of a pound per processor, and in the end, it ended up costing not one million, but one and a quarter. So, um, <coughs> not quite to plan. Now, I, I've, I've mentioned Human Brain Project funding, um, and I, at this point, I feel I ought to inject um, a slightly sad note uh, because within the Human Brain Project, in the Neuromorphic platform, we worked very closely with um, a group at Heidelberg who are developing another large-scale neuromorphic system which works on quite different principles, which is shown at the bottom right. And this group and the whole neuromorphic activity has been led throughout HBP by Karl Heinz Meyer, who very sadly uh, passed away last week. And, and I would like to acknowledge that, that a lot of what we've been able to do in HBP um, is due to Karl Heinz, uh, and uh, his passing is a major loss. He, with Henry Markram, uh, were the two principal proponents that led to the HBP flagship being funded in the first place. So he's a great loss, and um, the thing I, I noticed that whenever he was talking about neuromorphic computing in public, uh, he would always um, give equal emphasis to the brain scales work at Heidelberg and the Spinnaker work at Manchester. Um, a very balanced view, and, and I think that's an example of respecting the work of others um, that we can all follow. So I wanted to note that. Um, now, while we've been building this machine over the last 10 years, uh, those in the business will have observed there have been parallel developments in machine learning applications, and uh, industry has developed very impressive advances in machine learning uh, through the use of large-scale artificial neural nets. Now, artificial neural nets are not the same as the things we run on Spinnaker. Spinnaker is intended to support biological research, and therefore we model neurons that spike. Artificial nets don't spike, they produce continuous output. So there's a, there's a kind of, it may not sound like a very fundamental difference if you're not in the game, uh, but it's led to quite parallel but distinct development trajectories. And these artificial neural nets are now everywhere. If you talk to Siri on your iPhone or Alexa on your Amazon Echo, then when you say something, apart from the trigger which turns the speech system on, all, the, all that you say is sent off to some big data center for processing, and then the interpretation comes back with the answer to your question to your phone. So it's not happening in your phone, it's happening on the far side of the planet, typically. Um, and these are formidable networks. The, the, the way these work is, uh, you know, you, you show this particular net an image at the left-hand side. Images have been quite a major area of development. I think usually you show the picture of a cat, and then this flows through hundreds of layers of neurons, and at the right-hand end, there's a classifier which comes out and says, it's a cat, or if it's not trained properly, it comes out and says, it's a dog. And then at the right-hand end, you have to tell it the difference between a cat and a dog, and feed that difference all the way back up the network, adjusting millions of parameters until the network starts saying it's a cat. And if you show it um, 10 million pictures of cats, it'll become quite good at recognizing cats at the end of the process. Now, um, that's the artificial net. My observations of a biological net are that if you take my two-year-old grandson and show him one cat, 
he will recognise cats for the rest of his life. Okay? So there's some, some fundamental difference between what's going on in these industrial nets and biological nets. The problem is we don't understand how the biological net works. Now, my comparison is a bit unfair because, of course, the Google net that recognises cats starts off with a completely scrambled brain, whereas my two-year-old grandson starts off having had two years to build a model of the world inside his neural network into which cats fit rather neatly. Um, so, you know, th it's, it's not a simple comparison, but there's certainly a lot of interest in industrial networks in, re in learning from biological systems to reduce the training cost. If you could train your network with, you know, 100,000 cats instead of 10 million, it would dramatically affect the economics of those industrial processes. You see this network is characterised by, picture at the left, information flows to the right. Mainly the information flows in one direction in these nets, although <coughs> there is growing interest in a little bit of feedback, um, but that's hard, so there's not much of it. And it's trained through this mechanism called backpropagation, which is sending the errors back up the network. Um, if you look at the biological system, the picture is quite different. This is a, an abstract picture of cortex, and what you see is information sort of coming in at different places, going backwards and forwards, uh, flowing all over the place. It's a much less simple picture, um, and this is the kind of thing that we're trying to understand with tools such as Spinnaker in the Human Brain Project. The biology uses spiking networks, which means all they do is every so often they go ping. Okay, so all your thoughts while you're sitting there thinking deeply about what I'm saying or possibly thinking deeply about the refreshments you're going to next, um, th all those thoughts are patterns of pings flowing around between the neurons in your brain, to the best of our knowledge, which is not complete. Um, so they're spiking neurons, the cortex has two-dimensional structure and it's always sparsely connected. The current solution favoured for industrial networks, because they're densely connected, uh, are these GPU engines. Uh, this is the flavour of the month from NVIDIA. Um, this is um, a GPU, so originally designed for graphics, but it's very good at matrix operations, so the dense connections that typify industrial networks uh, fit here well. When they learn how to use sparse networks, as biology does, the GPU will go into history. Um, this box consumes about three kilowatts and uh, we're learning how to operate at increasingly low precision to get more efficiency out of these, uh, but it's still a fairly power-hungry device. If you want to model biological nets, then the state of the art is to use uh, a supercomputer. Um, now you can get reasonably efficient support for sparse connectivity, sparse matrices, and you can communicate spikes around uh, but now for one of these big machines, your power budget may have gone from kilowatts to megawatts. If you're prepared to accept a certain degree of simplification, down onto what are called neuromorphic systems, and you've heard Spinnaker described as one. Here, there's a, a very strong emphasis on localising the memory and computation so that the data moves around much less because that's really what burns power. And now you can get real-time networks running not on megawatts, but on milliwatts. So you see we've got a sort of scale of about nine orders of magnitude um, that, that you can explore while investigating this sort of system. And clearly there are widespread applications of artificial nets. There's much less direct exploitation of spiking nets, uh, but there's growing interest and you see big companies and startups playing or investing in this space. Uh, so this year, Intel announced the Loihi chip, which is a spiking neural network platform. Very impressive. IBM's had True North for about as long as we've had Spinnaker. And then startups, there are spin-outs from Zurich looking at um, spiking-based vision sensors. And here in Manchester, we'll hear later from, from Mike Denham uh, with Mindtrace, who've developed seed funding for working in this area. So there's an industry interest um, but there is, what we're, what we're really short of at the moment is compelling evidence that this neuromorphic technology can actually deliver uh, in commercial applications. It's clear it can deliver in brain science, but it's not yet clear that it will deliver in commercial applications. Anyway, what did we do? We made a chip, 
There it is. Um, it's a square centimetre of stuff, um, about 100 million moving parts on the chip. It took about five years and 40 man years of design work to put that together. One of my claims for microchip design as a research area is you get more PhDs to the square millimetre than in most subjects, <laughs> which is clearly an important metric. Um, we designed this chip between about 2006 and 2011, uh, so it's been around for quite a long time. And it's put in a package with a standard industry memory chip, and we can then tile a two-dimensional surface with it. Now, this isn't supposed to be a technical lecture. It's more a celebration, but what's on that chip? Well, there are 18 of these microprocessor things somewhere. Uh, there's quite a lot of memory. But the key innovation in Spinnaker is how we connect all this stuff together. And the thing you can't do with a conventional computer, even a supercomputer, is make the number of connections between neurons that you find in biological systems. So that was the focus of the Spinnaker design. That's the red bit in the middle. It's the router. Every time a neuron spikes on Spinnaker, it generates a tiny packet which flows around the system. And this is like the packets that flow around the internet, only these are very small. Internet packets carry kilobytes of data. Spinnaker packets carry a few bits of data. And we can then route these to many thousands of destinations. So it's not just going from A to B. It's going from A to 1,000 Bs. Um, and it has to arrive in a small fraction of a millisecond to deliver the biological real time that we're looking for. So that's the key. It's the only thing you need to know about Spinnaker, really. Uh, the rest is just lots of processors in a box. Um, making the stuff is fun uh, you know, for academic research projects. Um, we get our memories from Micron. I don't quite know where they actually make them, but they're headquartered in Boise, Idaho. Um, they send them across to um, Chengdu, to Unisem. The Spinnaker chips themselves are manufactured via Europractice, which means going through um, Leuven in Belgium. And they're manufactured by UMC in Taiwan, who then send the chips uh, to Unisem. Unisem assemble them in these small packages, and then the packages come back to us, and then we send them to Norcott, um, and th there are several people here from Norcott. Where are you, Pete? Oh, they're over there. This, this is the Norcott bunch. Um, <laughs> they, they play a crucial role in Spinnaker because they uh, get the PCBs made and then they assemble all the components onto them. And this is a, a non-trivial PCB to assemble because it's got a very large number of connections to be made reliably, and all the boards you see, there's one over there, and there are 1,200 in the machine, and there are several others lying around. These have all been um, through Norcott's hands, and uh, we've been very happy with the sort of collaborative way they've worked with us on building this stuff for Spinnaker. So we have these chips. There's what's inside the chip. I've never seen it. Um, you can only see this if you go to the assembly line, which is a clean room, so they won't let you in. Um, and they, they stick the Spinnaker chip down and then they stick the memory chip on top of it and then they wire them together with tiny gold wire with these machines that work at fabulous speed. And the astonishing thing is they can do this extremely cheaply. Um, so we can then put those on a circuit board. There's one down here. I, I'm never quite sure which side of this board to show, okay, because that's the pretty side, but all the flashing lights are on the back. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it that way for a bit. Um, and then we can take these boards and we can assemble them together um, in this large machine, which is in the machine room upstairs. And when we go up to the celebration for the refreshments, um, we're uh, organizing tours of small parties to go and see the machine. Um, there'll be some fairly evident sign-up mechanism when you get there. The machine room itself is not enormous, so we can really only take about a dozen or uh, take 20 in at once, I'm not sure. Anyway, so if you all want to go, we'll manage it, but it'll take quite a, a long serial operation uh, to organise that. Um, we build these big machines. We committed to deliver a half million core machine to the Human Brain Project um, by the end of March 2016, and that's been online, uh, serving remote users uh, across Europe and, in fact, around the world. Um, they're all submitting jobs, so we've run quite a lot of jobs. That's the good news. The bad news is they're all tiny. Um, so we have a huge machine, and nobody's quite worked out how to use it yet. That's the next challenge. 
Um, but that half million core platform will be, is now upgraded uh, to the one million cores, and uh, that's what we'll be offering through the Human Brain Project going forward. Uh, what can you say about the machine? Well, one of the statistics that terrifies me um, is that if you count up all the chips, the memory and the Spinnaker processing chip, there's about 10 square metres of active silicon area inside this machine, okay? And I th I've attempted to draw that roughly to scale to this cartoon man. Um, you know, when you think of microchips, you think of tiny things, but this is a microchip, you know, the size of this front area here. Um, it has many moving parts. With a machine this scale, it'll never all work at once. Um, and, and therefore, we've had to develop technologies that allow the hardware to accommodate faults and allow the software to understand how to use um, the machine whilst avoiding the bits that, that aren't proving reliable. So there's been a lot of engineering has gone into understanding how to make this machine appear reliable to its users. Um, but we're, we're pretty much there and, and the machine operates uh, pretty reliably uh, both for external users and we have quite a lot of users in-house. Now, so that's the big machine. Um, now we come to the high-risk bit of the talk uh, because this is where Andrew is going to come out and we're going to attempt a live boot of the machine and <laughs> the program that we've developed to do this um, does interesting things. It doesn't take too long. We're not switching it on because that takes quite a long time. If you just pull a big switch and turn it all on, the entire Manchester goes dark. <laughs> um, <coughs> so we're not doing that. Instead, what we're doing is we're bringing the machine up and the software is running on this laptop. And uh, what's going to happen? Let's go. So the first thing that I'll do, I'll press this button and um, we'll start the boot process. So all of these red lights that you can see up here are the Ethernet of the machine. Uh, there's 1,200 of them. Now, we've sent a boot image into one corner of this, and what's happening is it's spreading out the boot image across the whole machine. So what you can now see happening here is we're speaking to each of these Ethernets and asking, are you booted yet? And these are going, yep, yeah, we've, we've now received the image. So they're not fully booted. They're just getting ready to, to speak to all the other chips. So you can see the um, way the machine communicates here as well, because it obviously goes in around the circles, um, you can see it goes faster in one dimension than the other. So now it's reached a point where um, it's actually everything has received the image, and what's happening now is all the chips are communicating with each other really fast. So they're sending messages saying, we're here, we're here, we're here, and they're all finding paths throughout the machine, a way to communicate with all the other chips across the machine. Um, hopefully in a minute it will then finish that process and everything will go nice and blue. Is it going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, this process does take a little bit of time. And you can see the number in the middle is the number of processors reporting yeah. for duty. <laughs> so <this is> yeah. <laughs> and so now what's happening is it's now counting up the processors. So um, it's asking each chip how many processors you have, and we're adding on to this number in the middle as it goes up. Um, you'll see some black squares appear in this diagram, which is basically where, as Steve says, this machine isn't all going to work at once all the time, so we have to have parts of it that aren't working, and so sometimes we have chips that aren't um, responding to us at, at any one time. Um, with any luck, this will still go over a million. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so um, live demos are high risk activities. We, we, we did have a Here's one we made earlier, backup. <laughs> that wasn't it. But, 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 but that wasn't it, I can assure you. That was, that was happening live on the machine that you can uh, go up and see later on. Now, uh, we built the big machine. It's not the only machine around. In fact, um, we've got about 100 Spinnaker systems in use uh, around the world with other groups. Uh, we started off loaning them. Then we ran out of money to make boards to loan, so we started selling them. Um, and uh, you see that we've got pretty good global coverage. Uh, I guess we need a bit more interest in South America. Uh, I'm, I'm not really optimistic about Antarctica, but um, <laughs> we, we've got coverage everywhere else, from Auckland in New Zealand uh, to 
uh, some boards in Boise, Idaho, um, which is where I said Micron are based, but it's not Micron that have got the machines. I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and, and with the little boards, the, the four node boards, you can do you know, very localized mobile robotics work. With the big boards, such as this one here, you can get to the scale of a small insect brain, so you could model something like Drosophila. Uh, that's just the scale of the machine. It's not easy to get build a model of Drosophila, but in principle, that's what you can do. And then up to the million core machine here, which will support a mouse. And what can you do with this machine? Um, well, you're going to hear more about this later, um, but we've worked uh, with our HBP partners at Ulich, and Sasha is going to tell us more about this model um, after my talk. We've built a model which can be run on a supercomputer and also on Spinnaker, and we can compare the results and check that we get you know, numerically reasonable outcomes, because you know, if you run a very large number of processes in parallel, you've got to have some way of knowing that the results are sensible. Um, that's 77,000 neurons, 285 million synapses. The synapse is the connection from one neuron to another. And we'll hear more about that um, in a little while. We've also um, done some more abstract problems. So one of my students has built uh, uh, a stochastic spiking neural network that solves constraint satisfaction problems, of which the most familiar example is Sudoku. Um, and there you saw a solution emerging. That was one I recorded earlier, by the way, in case you're wondering. Um, and and uh, so this network um, uses a kind of stochastic annealing algorithm. It's very analogous to what you can do with a D-wave quantum annealing machine in terms of the class of problems that you can sensibly address with it. So these are abstract problems. And then um, of a more commercial application nature, we've got some preliminary work now on doing um, building very sparse networks that implement conventional deep networks. And here's something that uh, has a 96% accuracy on MNIST, which is reasonable for the size of network here, but it's only got 0.6% connectivity. So we're pursuing this idea of extremely sparse networks, much more like biology than the, industri than the industrial networks. We haven't stopped with Spinnaker 1. Um, within the HPP, we're developing a second generation chip in collaboration with uh, a very good silicon team at TU Dresden in Germany. Um, because of advances in process technology, we can go from 18 processors on a piece of silicon to 160, um, and this allows us to deliver uh, about 10x performance and efficiency improvement, uh, most of which comes from advances in process technology. So we're designing it to go with the memory. We've, you, know, you have to think very hierarchically about these big chips, so we're putting four processors in what we call a quad processing element, and then tiling 40 of these onto the chip. Um, and that's in, in, in mid-process at the moment. Uh, the first chip with, with this layout on has come out of fab. We haven't seen it yet. It's still in Dresden. Um, but we should be getting our hands on it and starting to play with it in January. So the work is still going on. Um, I'll sort of wrap up here. Um, just to summarize, you've heard this about three times already. Spinnaker has been a long time in conception, different millennium when we started thinking about this, um, building it for a long time. We set the million processor target quite early on. When we set it, I had no idea I would be drawing my state pension before we got there, but that's a, that's a different story. Um, we have machines with groups around the world. We're supported by the Human Brain Project uh, on the software side and developing the next generation. There's growing interest in what this kind of technology might do for industrial AI, th though <coughs> as yet no compelling demonstration um, that it's going to take over the world in that space. But there are a number of neuromorphic platforms um, with different trade-offs uh, between efficiency and flexibility. And Spinnaker is at the most flexible end because our neuron and synapse learning rules are all in software, so we can change them easily. Um, so it still seems to me that it's a very good way of, of developing research into this space. If you don't know what you want, you want a flexible platform to work out what you want. When you know what you want, you can then probably go and re-implement it more efficiently some other way. Now, I've done most of the standing at the front so far, um, but lots of people have, have contributed to this work. And uh, since it's a very long list, I've taken the nearest I can do to Hollywood techniques. Um, <laughs> 
<coughs> and uh, I hope I've got this right. Um, what, what I was going to suggest is, because this takes a little while to get through, will everybody who's worked on Spinnaker in the past or at the present stand up, please? So you see, it's, it's a lot of people, it's not quite the entire audience. Um, <laughs> but, any, but anyway, the achievement we're celebrating today is the achievement of the people you see before you. So I think we should give them a round of applause. Okay, so uh, I've said my bit, uh, and now we're going to hear uh, from uh, a couple of uh, activities that have used Spinnaker um, outside the Manchester group, and, and uh, they will tell us their experience. Nicely, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so so, uh, <laughs> so uh, the, the first speaker is Sasha van Albarda, who's from the Ulig Supercomputer Centre, and I'll hand over to her. Your applause was <laughs> missing now. Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Please give a hand to you. <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sasha van Albada. Um, I'm from uh, the research center in, uh, in Jülich. I'm a computational neuroscientist. And um, I've had the pleasure of working together with a group of Steve Ferber um, on a project in which we ported a neural network model uh, that is at the same time tiny and humongous uh, to Spinnaker. So uh, this work took place in two great European projects, uh, starting with uh, Brain Skills and uh, later uh, the Human Brain Project. Um, now, what is this huge? little circuit that I'm talking about. Um, it's a model of all the neurons and synapses in a square millimeter of mammalian cerebral cortex, amounting to roughly uh, 80,000 neurons connected uh, via about 300 million synapses. And the reason uh, for considering this circuit is um, that it forms a generic building block for a cerebral cortex as it captures most of the local synapses uh, because the local circuitry has a range of on the order of a few hundred micrometers. And uh, because most of the synapses onto cortical neurons are local, um, this uh, captures the majority of all the synapses onto the neurons and thereby the circuit is largely self-contained. Uh, the cerebral cortex is organized into layers um, and the model describes each of these layers with, uh, with two populations, an excitatory one, uh, so w the neurons that uh, increase the firing probability of their target neurons and an inhibitory population with neurons that decrease the probability of firing of the target neurons. And uh, what this model does, it, uh, it relates to um, the network structure, the connectivity, to the network dynamics. Um, and um, to keep things simple, we um, model each of the neurons with uh, identical intrinsic parameters so that we really focus on the influence of the connectivity on the dynamics. Uh, this connectivity is given by uh, layer and cell type specific connection probabilities, but apart uh, from these specific connection probabilities, the neurons are connected at random, so there's no further spatial structure. An external stochastic input to all the neurons represents the non-modeled parts of the brain. And uh, the model was originally implemented uh, using the neural network simulation software NEST and uh, run on a local compute cluster. In defining the connectivity of this circuit, um, the model integrates the knowledge from more than 50 experimental papers and it's thereby able to account for the type of neural activity uh, observed in the waking brain where the neurons fire action potentials in an asynchronous and irregular manner. 
You can see this in this uh, so-called raster plot or dot display. The, uh, the neurons are ordered uh, along the y-axis and the x-axis represents time and each dot is a spike of one neuron. The spikes of the excitatory neurons are in blue and those of the inhibitory neurons in red. And one feature uh, you see, so the, the asynchrony because um, you don't see uh, any vertical stripes here and if you look at the uh, spike times of one particular neuron then they um, occur at irregular intervals. Um, also the inhibitory neurons tend to spike at higher rates than the excitatory neurons in the same layer uh, despite the identical parameterization of the cells um, and traditionally the, the higher rates of the inhibitory neurons were attributed to different intrinsic properties but this uh, model shows that it can also be accounted for by the network structure. And a final experimental observation that the model is able to re reproduce is that the firing rates differ across layers with layer 2, 3 having um, the lowest rates and uh, layer 5 the highest rates. In our project with uh, Jülich and Manchester, uh, we set out to bring this model to Spinnaker. Um, and it quickly turned out that this was a bit of a challenge because the properties of the network differ th from those of neuro uh, neural network models that had previously been simulated on Spinnaker. In particular, our model had um, shorter time constants so that we needed uh, uh, shorter integration time steps and also a larger number of uh, synapses per neuron and uh, this uh, causes the input rates to the neurons to be very high and that could be a problem because if the receiving neurons are still busy processing other spikes then the spike may not be delivered on Spinnaker. Um, but um, our colleagues here in Manchester, uh, especially um, Andrew Rowley, uh, were able to solve these issues and uh, to run the model on six Spinnaker boards, which a quick calculation will show is still less than 1% of the full system as it is in place now. And um, in a comparison between uh, nest simulations uh, on a time grid, nest simulations with uh, precise spike times not restricted to grid and Spinnaker, we found that um, the statistical uh, dynamical properties of this model were equally well uh, represented on uh, each system and this means that uh, the fixed point arithmetic and the asynchronous update of Spinnaker were valid uh, design features. I understand that the new Spinnaker system um, uh, will support uh, floating point arithmetic um, making it even better able to represent biological neural networks such as this one. And I think one important aspect of this collaboration was that we computational neuroscientists and the neuromorphic hardware developers here in Manchester understand much better now what each of us means, uh, <laughs> what each of us does and what the challenges, concepts and, and solutions are so that uh, these uh, insights from, from each side can flow into the, the simulator development, uh, uh, into the traditional and neuromorphic simulator development alike. Now what makes these particular results interesting? Well, as I mentioned, the cortical microcircuit can be considered as a sort of building block for cortex because it represents a large percentage, the majority of the synapses impinging on the neurons and making it largely self-contained. And we also know um, about Spinnaker that it has a smart way of routing the signals between the neurons so that in principle the communication only grows linearly with network size. And these two factors combined mean that we could in principle take a whole lot of these building blocks um, and um, fill all of Spinnaker, one million, Spinnaker's uh, one million cores with microcircuit building blocks and simulate 10 mouse brains or a small portion of a human brain. In this study uh, we also uh, characterized the performance of Spinnaker and Nest in terms of speed and power consumption 
And when plotting the results um, of these measurements, we chose some really nice colors. But uh, a big conundrum arose, which was what to call these colors. Um, and an early idea of, of Marcus Diesmann was to call, uh, yeah, it's difficult to see, but the mapping phase, to call that orange and to call this brown. But I, I thought that this required a bit of a stretch of the imagination. And um, I proposed magenta for this phase, to which uh, <laughs> Marcus replied, there's no dis discussion about magenta in this country. This is defined by German telecom. And, and, and he had a good point. Um, and he helpfully went on to suggest alternatives, namely um, salmon for the mapping phase and raspberry <laughs> for the data generation phase. And reading this, for some reason, I suddenly felt like having a nice meal. So I, I thought this was quite a good combination. And so I said, you know, I'm starting to get hungry. Um, and consequently, we, we kept this gourmet selection in our caption. And whether due to our culinary offerings or other factors, our paper has been receiving a surprising amount of um, attention for a paper with such a long title. <laughs> uh, um, already more than, than 15,000 views, which brings us into the uh, 97th percentile of uh, all Frontiers papers, even though our paper only appeared in May this year. Um, and also the media picked up on our study and it was featured not only on the University of Manchester and um, Research Center Ulich websites, but also on Science Daily and on the um, American radio show um, Science Friday. And um, because of all this media coverage, I even got an invitation to speak at a, a TEDx event in India uh, about Spinnaker. So uh, now, I in no way agree with Trump's attacks on the media, but um, it does indicate that a little bit of distortion is taking place because now I'm suddenly seen as a Spinnaker expert. <laughs> <laughs> when all I've done is to perform one study in collaboration with the actual Spinnaker experts here. So um, what's more, it appears that due to our study, we are suddenly very close to curing Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> if it's written on the same page, page as, as these soap opera spoilers, then it must be true. <laughs> so in fact, when I investigated the evolution of uh, views of our paper, I discovered that the sudden jump in, in views uh, precisely coincided with the appearance of our paper on the Us Against Alzheimer's website. So correlation, causation, who will tell? <laughs> and we can also learn from the media that Spinnaker is not in fact a neuromorphic supercomputer, but a mere brain-inspired laptop. <laughs> PC, <laughs> which has been tested for uh, vitality effectivity, um, among other things to incorporate studying and other issues, and that it, it does so via the trade of alerts between neurons. But at least it's a laptop with one million cores, so <laughs> I think that's no mean feat. <laughs> And I, um, I mentioned before that the microcircuit we, we simulated can serve as a building block for much larger networks, no longer uh, big little circuits, <laughs> but truly big circuits. Um, in Jülich, we've already started thinking in this direction, and we have developed a model of all uh, vision-related cortical areas in one hemisphere of the brain of the macaque monkey. 
uh, consisting of uh, 32 microcircuits. Uh, this model contains 4 million neurons uh, connected via 24 billion synapses and is currently implemented in NEST and runs on a supercomputer in Jülich. Um, and since a single microcircuit obviously was not enough of a challenge for our colleagues here in Manchester, our next project as part of the Human Brain Project um, is to port this model to Spinnaker. So I warmly congratulate Steve Ferber and his group for uh, creating this million core neuromorphic laptop. <laughs> and I look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, that was uh, that was great. Um, so, if you fancy finding a strong chair somewhere and sitting down and asking us to put our million core laptop on your lap, <laughs> what does it weigh? About five tons. <laughs> um, yes. Good luck. The, uh, the cortical microcolumn work is, uh, was, was very challenging for us and, and uh, really pulled the state of our technology forward. Um, and we're now using it as a benchmark for tuning the software. When the paper was written, loading and running the cortical microcolumn model took about eight hours. It now takes about eight minutes. Um, it ran on six boards with a 20 times slowdown from real time. And Dr. Lester on the front row claims he can now run it on less than one board in real time. So we've seen a sort of, since the paper was printed, about a factor 100 improvement in both the runtime and, and the execution efficiency. Um, we haven't yet seen Dave demonstrate his 100 ex <laughs> execution efficiency, but you agree, Dave, you're going to do that. Okay. Anyway, um, we should move on and. Um, the next speaker is Mike Denham um, from Mindtrace.ai. Where are you going? Oh, he's there. Yes. Good. <laughs> Still in the room. Okay, Mike, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's uh, the usual sort of thing with the pointer and the red okay. button. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to start off by adding my congratulations to Steve and the Spinnaker team, which we saw quite a few people in the audience. Um, for this amazing project and the, the success of being able to achieve this um, million core machine is, is absolutely amazing. And uh, I'd just like to say that this is largely due to the sort of inspiration which Steve has provided over the last decade or more. I've known Steve for, for many years and um, He's been an inspiration to me as well in the area of neuromorphic computing and computational neuroscience. And to see this machine growing and this opportunity to actually really build serious computational neuroscience models in a, in a scale which represents the human brain or a subpart of the human brain, I think is truly amazing. And I'd also like to say how happy I am to be here today to celebrate with the team, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'd like to introduce you to um, our company, Mindtrace.ai. Um, we've been in existence, uh, my co-founder here, uh, Camilla Dimova, uh, since January 2017. And as Steve mentioned earlier, around about a, a, almost exactly a year ago, we were successful um, after a lot of hard work to get venture capital funding for our seed investment of uh, 1.5 million pounds. And that's been uh, an inspiration for us to see Spinnaker and, and know that we have a platform on which we can start to investigate how uh, this type of architecture can contribute to the important area and the growing area of machine intelligence. So what our aim is, is to take a brain-inspired approach to developing machine intelligence. Uh, our strap line, which um, we use a lot now, is making machines think. 
And this has come about really because there's a, we believe that the current state of machine intelligence, although it, as Steve mentioned earlier, it's made remarkable progress over the last five years in particular in image and speech recognition, natural language processing and so on, that the current technology, what we think of as deep learning or deep neural networks, comes nowhere near matching what we think of as the human capabilities of, of intelligence. Uh, the need to train on tens or hundreds of thousands of uh, examples, for instance, is something which we don't do. And it's very uh, rigid and fragile in transferring learning from a, new, from a, a, a trained situation to a novel situation on which it hasn't been fully trained. In contrast, as we've also heard, humans learn new concepts from just a single or a few examples, what we call or is becoming known as one-shot learning. They generalize robustly and accurately to transfer knowledge into new domains. And we can use those learned concepts in a much more richer way for action, imagination, creativity, and so on. To give you an example of what we mean by one-shot learning, this is uh, an example taken from a paper by Brendan Lake and his colleagues, uh, including Ruslan Salik-Hutinov, who um, leads the AI group at Apple, and, uh, and Josh Tannenbaum, which probably you've heard of at MIT, a very renowned guy. Um, so what this is, you take a single handwritten character from a set of alphabets, and you provide a set of candidate characters for matching. And the question, the simple question is, what is the best match of this character with the candidates? Well, we can do it quite quickly. That's the one which is the best match. So think about how you did that. You probably think, well, what I did was I looked at that example and thought, how was it built? How was it constructed? How did I draw that? Or how was it drawn? And then look for something which was drawn in a similar way. So what effectively we're doing is using an internal model, a generative internal model, of our understanding of the world and how characters are drawn and how they're built up. In other words, how we could take a character and parse it into its constituent components. And the fundamental component of this is this idea of this internal generative model. MindTrace's mission is to provide machines with human levels of intelligence, make machines think. We believe that the component parts of that primarily are to be able to do things like one-shot learning, to be able to continuously learn from not, not go away and do a big learning exercise in the cloud and then come back and do inference and then go away again and have to do another learning uh, exercise. To smoothly transfer existing knowledge into new domains and to make goal-based predictive autonomous decisions in new and unexpected situations. And that there are many, many applications out there of such a technology, if we can achieve it, which will take the world of AI, machine intelligence, into a different category. So what is our particular approach, which we're adopting in MindTrace? Well, we're trying to exploit the synergy between brain-inspired algorithms. And my background is about 40 odd years in academic computational neuroscience, studying the mechanisms and the architecture of the brain. And <coughs> combine that with this wonderful neuromorphic hardware, which is rapidly developing now, and of which Spinnaker is a major current example. So one of the things which we realize that we need is to build these probabilistic generative internal models and combine them with deep neural network models of learning and inference, which are inspired by this architecture and processing mechanisms of the brain, and deploy them, and this is the important bit, 
on event-based asynchronous many-core brain-inspired computing hardware. We're firmly of the belief that if we want to go in this direction, we need the sort of hardware platforms and computer architectures which Steve's group has provided through the Spinnaker uh, computing system. Because it, it allows you to do things in a way which we, we can't do on things like GPUs. No matter how powerful those GPUs become, they still have a fundamental restriction in terms of the ability to accommodate this type of architecture with all its feedback connections and so on. And in particular, one of the most important things which is growing now in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning is the issue of energy. When we started thinking about this maybe two or three years ago, talking to people in, in Silicon Valley, they were all saying, well, energy is not so important. Now, energy is becoming a top priority. Energy efficiency, especially with the growing emphasis on the use of machine learning at the edge of the cloud. So the opportunity which uh, platforms like Spinnaker provide in terms of low energy um, is absolutely crucial to provide the sort of applications that we need from mobile to the edge. What we're doing initially is to develop in the company what we call our technology demonstrator or proof of concept. This is a fast, low energy machine vision system which uses end-to-end -end event based processing. It takes a dynamic vision sensor which many of you may have heard of which is basically a sensor which is not like a normal camera which is frame based but has a set of independent pixels which report only motion. In other words, contrast change at that pixel. And it does that within microseconds. So it's producing a stream of events, and those events are then processed by our algorithms using the neuromorphic event-based computing platform of Spinnaker. So here's the, the general picture. So we have a, a, a real world image, an object of interest. The sensor is a dynamic vision sensor. And then we process that using a combination of our brain-inspired algorithms with the brain-inspired neuromorphic event-based computing system. The application we're targeting initially is something called autonomous emergency braking which is fast becoming one of the most important safety uh, systems within modern cars. Um, its advantages over existing systems, which we claim for our system, will be that it would be fast with microsecond latency, doing selection, tracking, and recognition of vulnerable road users through this end-to-end -end parallel processing system. It has a high dynamic range due to the nature of the DVS camera. Very low energy due to the nature of the algorithms and the computing platform. And a very fast response time. Our initial performance target is the new car assessment program, which is being run by the European Union, which is uh, in relation to what we call vulnerable road users and in particular, looking at car to pedestrian and car to cyclist impacts, which are one of the most frequent accidents which happen and lead to very serious injuries and uh, um, very large, uh, uh, it's a very important issue to actually address in terms of safety and security in vehicles. <coughs> Our aim is to achieve a significant impact on that field and provide, by providing this fast, accurate, low energy solution and substantially reduce pedestrian and driver injuries and loss of life. Okay, so this is us. This is our board. We are very fortunate to having a chairman, Hussein Yassai. So Hussein Yassai was previously the CEO of Imagination Technologies and he's very kindly taken up uh, our 
um, interests as a, as the chairman of our board. I mentioned uh, my co-founder, and you'll notice Steve here as a member of our board. But most importantly is these guys sitting down below here, many of whom I think everybody probably is in the audience, and that's our team of researchers and engineers and software developers. And they're providing the, the energy and the enthusiasm to deliver what I've been talking about today. So thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I couldn't go into any technical details as in the other talks, but you'll understand that commercially we have some difficulties in talking about detailed technical issues. So, thank you. Okay, so I think that um, ends the program of presentations. I'd like to thank Sasha and Mike very much for sort of complementing my talk on the history of Spinnaker to give some examples of uh, uses of the machine, and, and we very much like those to expand. Uh, we have a lot of resource now, so we're looking for, for big challenges uh, for the future. Um, but I think the program now demands that we uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions, and I think Gavin is going to uh, manage this somehow, and I, and I think you can direct questions to, to me, Mike, or Sasha as you see fit. Is that uh, how we're going to run it? Yeah, that could be good. Can I ask Sasha to come up front and ask a question? <coughs> Um, well, thanks for that. For that really amazing. Um, you mentioned that you've, you've got a hundred of these spin making machines around the world, is that right? Yeah, little ones. Little ones. I mean, you know, this, some are smaller than this, some are a bit bigger, but there are not a hundred million core spinnaker machines around the world. So my question was going to be, you've got a hundred of them, and they did one percent, why not tie them all together? <laughs> 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 Thank you. <coughs> Hi. Well, thank you for um, presenting such a beautiful project. Since I'm first year doing PhD in cybersecurity, I'm just wondering for such a um, big project how to cover um, the project back. Does it go under any like um, cybersecurity testing to make sure such chips are secure enough um, before going to a real world facing yes. problems? So I I, I see if you've invented Skynet. No, no, I. <laughs> I'm pleased to re report the Spinnaker machine itself has absolutely no security mechanisms whatsoever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 the manual, the manual. <laughs> um, uh, of, of course, it, it, it isn't physically connected directly to the internet. There is, a, there is a host machine that manages it, and the host machine has uh, normal levels of security. But uh, um, I don't think Spinnaker is a real security risk at the moment. Um, if anybody can work out how to make it do anything interesting in that space. <laughs> uh, <laughs> please, please, please let us know, yes, yes. Or, or, yes, or, or sign up for a PhD, that, that would be... That would be yeah. <laughs> I was just, um, just wondering if there were any limits on scalability other than financial. Oh, um... So the, the, the architecture does have some limits, um, uh, but they, they can all be circumvented. I mean, it, it was, it, we set the million core target really uh, to pick a very big number um, so that we had to address scalability head on from the outset. Um, but we did, uh, for a million core, there is a sort of internal address space which is addressing chips and it's 16 bits, so it was a kind of 65k limit, but I'm sure we could get around that if we had to. Um, the neuron identifiers that are sent around the machine are 32-bit, 
but so potentially there's a four billion neuron limit. But again, actually, if you use you could, if you use the number locally in one area, you can reuse it in another area. So that's not a hard limit. I suspect we begin to have trouble maintaining the real time if we made the machine ten times the size. Um, the other limit, as you'll see, is it fits in a fine size room. Um, and uh, there is only 100 kilowatts of electricity available in that room, so, um, so and 100 kilowatts of cooling. Um, the machine, if you work it all very hard, which is a challenge, which I set you, um, then you can get it up towards 100 kilowatts. Um, although normally we manage it down to one or two kilowatts to save the university's electricity bill. You'll be pleased to know. <laughs> <coughs> Actually, the other problem we have, I asked Jim for permission to... Uh, you need a microphone. Manch Give him a microphone. Dave wishes to make a comment. <laughs> I asked Jim whether we could um, have a megawatt machine for the next generation, and he said the substation could be replacing underneath this room, and um, somebody would have to pay the electricity bill. So uh, those are two constraints which are worth mentioning in this context. This question just said. Uh, have you got any uh, applications outside the neuromorphic space that you're looking at? Well, um, so the machine looks a bit like a general purpose parallel computer, uh, except the cores, of course, are very small. Um, so, uh, I mean, we do run non neural applications on it. Um, we have a, a, a model that we use for, for debugging the machine early on, which is just a heat diffusion model, which is. Uh, you know, doing a very simple algorithm at each node. Um, and, and there have been some other things. We've run large-scale Markov chain Monte Carlo um, generation on the machine. Um, you can do other things, but you have to ask yourself the question as to whether it's the right machine if you want to do... Um, the, if you have a problem which is, which is elegantly dis, uh, ex expressed as a large graph where all the nodes are doing relatively simple things, and there's lots of small-scale communication going on, then there's a reasonable chance we can support it. Um, but it, it's, it's certainly not a general-purpose computer. There's one thing it does better than a high-performance computer, which is model real-time systems of spiking neurons. Almost everything else, it does worse. <coughs> Do we have any more questions? Perhaps on the neuro, neuroscience side, anybody curious? Hi. Okay. Uh, I think this is probably more about the human brain project. Are you trying to understand how the human brain works, or are you trying to replicate the decisions that the human brain might make? Oh, oh. <laughs> there is a supplementary to this. Oh. <laughs> so, so far, uh, we have not looked into decision making and we would like to understand how how the human brain works because i think a question that actually comes to mind is if you want to replicate decision making how do you differentiate between the decisions that led to say trump or brexit <laughs> <laughs> and um he, d he subscribed to Here's a clumsy fraud scheme. So, uh, I think this impinges on, on you know, you, often given a bit more time, I talk about Turing's views on human like artificial intelligence and why it's proved so much harder to build that kind of intelligence into machines than Turing and many people since him expected. And I think that's because Turing made the mistake of thinking that human intelligence was based on logic. And there's been quite, you know, there's half a century of symbolic AI which is based on that assumption, which turns out, you know, to be interesting but not as a way of understanding human intelligence. Because I think human intelligence is sometimes the opposite of logic. And you've, you've quoted some good examples, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just out of curiosity, and contrary to 
to the other smaller machines around the world, you have in one room all these <coughs> small versions of the small machines that you try to work in unison. I wonder, besides thinking of a bigger brain or a human brain, is there maybe any interest on trying to make each of the little ones individual agents and make them work not as a single computer but as a group of small insects to investigate <coughs> emergent phenomena in, you know, basically because you have all these computers in the same place and you can <coughs> make them talk as individual entities. Is there any interest in that? Uh, certainly that's a possible way of making valid use of the big machine. There are, there, are, there, are many, there are more ways of making valid use of the big machine than just building a single big network to run on it. And uh, so, so uh, one, one of my students, Ed, is Ed here? He's wave, wave somewhere? Yes, Ed, Ed has sort of built a, a genetic algorithm framework which runs hundreds of jobs, hundreds of smallest jobs on the, on the machine simultaneously. So you can use it for running lots of independent jobs, but if you want to um, investigate swarm intelligence and you want to model each of those intelligences as a small network then that's certainly again something uh, that you could use the machine to do. Um, the, 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 there's a vast number of things one could do um, and life is finite uh, so we can't pursue all the interesting options but if you, I mean the machine's available if you want to do that. <laughs> I saw Carol. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to ask a question on behalf of shy colleagues, which is, uh, why did you call it Spinnaker? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yes, okay. Um, I, I, you know, choosing project names is, is, is an interesting question. Spinnaker is a sort of compression of spiking neural network architecture. And, and uh, if you're observant, you'll see that we always spell Spinnaker with two capital N's in the middle. Um, uh, so it, it kind of, it's not an acronym, but it's a kind of compression, um, and it makes for a nice pretty logo um, <laughs> because of the sailing association. You see pictures of sails, even on balloons these days, apparently. <laughs> uh, so, so, so that's the origin of the name. I mean, I, I like to find uh, a name for a project which transcends the particular funding regime in which it started. Uh, it's a name that can basically eat funds for the rest of time, that's, that's, <laughs> <coughs> uh, because actually I, I think, you know, individual three-year projects are not long enough to really establish a, a visible brand, and so, so getting a reasonable name, and I think, you know, in the 90s we had Amulet for our asynchronous processors, and that covered a whole range of funding uh, sources, and, and Spinnaker has actually become quite well established as an internationally recognisable brand in the rather sort of small sphere of neuromorphic computer people. Um, but it's, you know, it, it, it's, it gives it recognition that, that transcends uh, whatever particular project it's being funded through at the time. Maybe I have a follow-up question for you then. Oh. So have, have you already been, um, been contacted by people from the, sailing, the world of sailing? <laughs> no. <laughs> Although it, it, it does mean if you, you know, if you go searching for Spinnaker videos on YouTube, you will learn quite a lot about sailing on the way to finding what you're looking for. <laughs> uh, there's a question here in the middle. Yeah. Um, there are many attempts to estimate when we'll be able to simulate the human brain uh, its functionality. Would you like to make an estimate of when you'll be able to simulate a mouse brain? So, um, yeah, yeah, so I claim the machine has enough capacity to do that, admittedly with, with, with relatively simplified neural models. So, um, you know, biology is extremely complex, and you have to abstract a lot of that complexity away to get something you can compute sensibly at scale. So, so there's a lot of simplification going on here. Um, within the Human Brain Project, there are already exists a complete mouse brain model. Okay, now it's very rudimentary, and, and uh, when uh, Mark Oliver Gvaltig was here describing it, he said, you know, think of the first attempt to draw an atlas of the globe, okay? They, they drew this thing, some bits of it are recognisable, some bits are a bit wrong, and Australia was completely missing because they did it before Australia had been discovered. And I think the mouse brain model is probably 
at a, at a similar state of rudimentary development. Um, but it is a model that we can potentially run, although there's quite a lot of work required to, uh, to change the way it's constructed to make it suitable for running on Spinnaker. Um, I mean, it, the mouse brain is, is just under 100 million neurons, and um, the current representation of the mouse brain, if you imagine the connections between those 100 million neurons, you can think of a matrix which has 100 million rows and 100 million columns, um, and then the connections are drawn into it. That's rather hard for us to deal with. Uh, we have to somehow cluster those groups and break them down, impose the kind of hierarchy that we like in our models, and, and, and then it might be possible. And Dave is still shaking his head. So. Take a long time to run. <laughs> Sorry, can I just expand on that and ask, so what's the inputs and outputs on your machine that simulate inputs and outputs yeah. for the most? Yeah, of course, th th this, is, this is an important question when you're brain modelling, is, is that for most purposes, you know, brains without inputs um, have no purpose um, and, and, and just sit there and quiver. Um, the, uh, uh, the standard um, approach to this is to try and embody the brain in some kind of uh, en uh, body, uh, embody in a body, does that make sense? Um, and again, in the Human Brain Project, there is a virtual robot mouse, which is actually quite realistic. So potentially you could embed this virtual brain, you know, occupying these enormous racks, um, and, and couple it to a, a model of the mouse. Now that is easy to say, um, I think very challenging to do. And of course then you connect the virtual mouse brain to the virtual mouse robot and if the result likes cheese you're getting somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but uh, virtual, cheese. virtual cheese, yes, okay. What does virtual cheese virtually smell of? <laughs> I don't know. So, so embodiment is an important step. Um, for the small brain regions then you, then you can um, find what data is known about what the inputs to those regions look like and what the outputs should look like. And, um, and, and the microcolumn model that Sasha talked about, uh, a lot is known about the rest state of, of, of the cortex, and, and basically that was a rest state model. But in HBP, we have uh, theoreticians who are interested in adding functionality to those models and understanding what they do, other than sit there and quiver. Um, so you, you can do it locally. Um, but often there's a fundamental problem. If you take a bit of brain, it's a black box. You don't know what the inputs are. You don't know what the outputs should be. So how do you know the black box is doing anything sensible? Is, is, is quite an important question to ask yourself regularly. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 <coughs> uh, see, with the Spinnaker 2 chip coming up, with 160 processor on each chip, uh, would it, we be able to model one meaningful portion of the brain, like video cortex? Uh, no. Um, you might you might be able to get to something like a small insect brain, um, but even that's pushing it a bit, I think. No, I think you'd need a few a few of those little a few Spinnaker two chips to get to insect brain. I mean, ideally, the Spinnaker two chip will have the capability of one of the current boards like that. But in fact, that's only ideally. In, in, in less than perfect circumstances, it's a bit less than, it's about a third of a board. Um, so what, what we'll be talking about, 160 cores, 250 neurons a core, that's 40,000 40, neurons. A drosophila is about 100,000 neurons, so you're talking about less than half of drosophila. And dro Drosophila is not very bright, by the way. You, <laughs> you have to go up to um, about 850,000 neurons to get to honeybees, and they're quite clever. And with those chips, if we make this uh, machine, bigger machine, would we be able to simulate some portion, a big portion of things? Well, it's about 10x. So if, uh, we're, we're currently, you know, 1% on some very idealistic assumptions. We're a bit behind that. So I think with a similar size machine made out of Spinnaker 2 would be a few percent um, of, of the human brain, or several mice. Um, getting funding to build a big Spinnaker 2 machine is going to be interesting. 
Who should I look at here? <laughs> okay, so with that talk of spinning the two and the future, uh, I think this is an appropriate time perhaps to uh, say uh, thank you to our speakers today and uh, say one final big congratulations to the entire spinning the team, past and present, as well as Steve for having the vision to bring this to fruition. So we give them all a big round of applause.